Okay, hello. Uh, I'm thrilled to have joining us the director of Welcome to Chechnya, David France, and Kamali Powell, who's the executive director of Rainbow Railroad. Uh, great to have you with us, gentlemen, and let's get into some discussion about uh, this incredible, powerful film. Um, David, if I could start uh, by asking you how you came to be aware of the subject, the purge of LGBTQ people in Chechnya, and you know, how you knew that uh, you had to make this film. Absolutely. Well, first, let me thank you for um, finding a way to make this film festival move forward in these challenging times. And um, I'm really proud to have the film in the festival. Um, and I'm grateful for the people who have come to watch it. So thank you all. Um, I first read about the disaster that's going on still in Chechnya in the south of Russia in early 2017, when the news broke first in a Russian national newspaper and then headlines went around the globe that this awful campaign was being conducted against the lgbtq community there which uh, was described by the leader of chechnya as a cleansing campaign an effort to route out queer people in uh, the Re republic of chechnya for elimination it was just a horror like i never had imagined could um take foot again i mean not since hitler have gay people been rounded up in this systematic top-down way and, um, for extermination. So it was an incredible crime against humanity that, um, that uh, found some uh, political leaders around the globe uh, denouncing it and calling for investigations, et cetera. But, um, but that cry didn't last very long. Um, and uh, so I thought, well, the problem had been resolved. I mean, I, I, unlike Kamali and the activists who are doing the work, I, I relied on the news media and I, it, it lulled me into a complacency. And, and then in this, that summer, I, I, I read another article, one in the New Yorker by the journalist Masha Gessen about the uh, extensive work that activists had pulled together in the shadows in Russia to literally rescue people and work with their um, colleagues around the world like Kamali and especially Kamali to find ways to get them um, safely out of Russia where they were being hunted to, uh, to parts of the world where they would be safer. And, uh, and w after reading the piece, I called Masha, the journalist and said, you know, we really have to tell this story in as many platforms and as many ways as we can. And she agreed to join me in, in making this film. So I began immediately. I started recording in late July of 2017 for 18 months. Kamali, uh, tell us a little bit about the work um, that Rainbow Railroad does and, and the organization's involvement in the film, if you would. Sure, and thanks for having me as well. Um, you know, our involvement and awareness of this scenario um, uh, is similar around hearing the story of uh, Novelesa Gazeta, really a crucial um, Russian newspaper who uh, was bravely reporting the information on, on the front lines. Uh, and Rainbow Railroad um, as a, a uh, international organization founded in Toronto, Canada, but uh, international with um, an office in New York. Um, we had by that, our focus was to help uh, LGBTQI plus persons find safety. Um, a, usually in another country like the West where they uh, can be free of persecution and live their authentic selves. And up until that point, we were largely doing work outside of the Caribbean and other disparate countries, but on a one-to-one -one basis. And when we heard of the crisis, this was pretty extraordinary. This was a, what was unique around this kind of uh, terror campaign was the fact that uh, individuals were literally disappearing and rounded up um, by the dozens. And... Um, you know, myself, alongside other organizations like Human Rights Watch, were just on a fact-finding mission. Um, it, was, it was an interesting period in journalism uh, because Masha Geshen's piece really was a seminal report 
that came later. But in the first instance, at the, at the beginning, there was really a lot of speculation. The first report from Russia was really crucial, but then terms like gay concentration tramp were being thrown around. Um, not that it wasn't a not that it wasn't a terror campaign, uh, but we we didn't have accuracy as to what was actually happening, and it was a fact finding with the support of Human Rights Watch and others, which led us to the crucial piece of the Russian LGBT network. You see, if if this was a concentration camp or if there was a permanent um, fixture where people were being detained indefinitely, then it was just a purely dipl diplomatic uh, effort, uh, and a small charity like ours really wouldn't be able to do anything. But it was that crucial moment when we realized this fierce, brave group of individuals, just with like sheer will and determination, were creating this clandestine path pathway. Then we realized, oh, these individuals can actually be supported, and if we were able to support their work we can get people out. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And David, uh, this is a very dangerous situation for uh, LGBTQ people and their supporters in both Chechnya and Russia. Tell us about uh, finding the people to, to show case in the film, to, to tell their stories, but also how you were able to navigate uh, managing their safety while you were making the film. It was a great um, security challenge. Um, and it was one that concerned the people who are operating the, the underground um, network in Moscow and in St. Petersburg when they, um, when I first asked them to let me film. And um, we worked out uh, security protocols that, would, um, that involved me taking uh, distinct routes to get to the various safe houses, um, filming not with any professional equipment, the film has been put together uh, with mostly a, a prosumer camera. It looked kind of like a tourist camera um, and cell phones and GoPros. We didn't use any lighting equipment. We didn't use any professional sound equipment. We recorded a lot of sound on iPhones. Um, so we, we just appeared to be kind of, you know, you know door to door salespeople, more or less, uh, making our rounds. Um, and uh, doing everything we could to make sure that we went undetected. Um, and then when, we, when I got inside the, the main shelter in Moscow, I may, began to make my proposals to the people who are fleeing um, that I should uh, like to film them as they're going uh, through their awful journeys. And people were very reluctant, uh, rightfully so, because of, how risky it was for them at the moment, but also what they knew that I didn't know was that they were gonna be hunted for the rest of their lives. That this campaign wasn't really about removing them from Chechnya, it was about uh, removing them from life. And wherever they went, um, they would be in danger. As long as anybody in Chechnya believed that they were still alive, their, their risks, um, were only slightly diminished, even in Toronto, even in Paris, even in places where you would hope that they would be out of reach and, and that uh, infrastructure in society was strong enough to be able to protect them. Um, so I, I promised them that I would disguise them, not really knowing how I would do it. Um, and, uh, and, and I was lucky that they agreed. Um, People had filmed the inside the shelter before, news, op, uh, news cameras had been in, but people only would give interviews in shadows or wear, while wearing hoodies or in some other way to make sure that their faces were not exposed. And I had asked them to actually let me see their face because I wanted to experience the journey with them uh, by knowing what that journey meant to them. And, um, and they luckily agreed to do it. There are many people in the shelters that are not on the screen because they didn't feel the confidence uh, and they were just too frightened. Um, and so I promised not to shoot them at all. Um, and then we and had to mount a security campaign around the footage to make sure that the footage was, which could give away so much, which could cost lives. Uh, both never fell into the wrong hands, but also was encrypted to such a degree that even if it did, 
it would not endanger anybody. Um, so we built a, um, a system for encrypting the footage, for getting it out of the country immediately, usually the day we shot it immediately, overwriting all the cards that are in the cameras to make sure that even if we lost them, you know, they, they couldn't be restored. And, um, and then we built an edit room that was air gapped so that the footage never touched a computer that had ever touched the internet. We never moved footage around in the traditional ways. We did not network our edit suite. Uh, and we um, brought in all sorts of um, securities and alarm systems and the like to protect what was there as well. So we, we um, uh, I think, are a case study in how to, the extremes that you have to go to and the expense that you have to go to to be able to tell stories like this uh, with some assurances to the subjects that they will, they will never be found out. Um, and that nothing I do, and this certainly would have weighed on me heavily and did as we were doing the work, uh, would in any way further endanger them. Mm, absolutely, yeah. A, a case study indeed and how to, to do it right in terms of protecting your subject. Let's talk about one of the, the elements that you used, uh, the facial replacement techniques that you used in the film. It, it's a, a stunning moment uh, in the film to see Grisha's face sort of become his real face. Um, we've come to know him looking the way he does. And then when he decides to speak out, his, his true face is able to be revealed. Um, what led you to the decision to use that technology and what were the challenges of incorporating it into a documentary? I think this is probably one of the first examples of this kind of, of technology being used. It is the first, we had to invent it. Um, and we had to find a VFX company that was willing to experiment with us um, and do all that experimentation offline, you know, as our protocols demanded. And we tried many other approaches and other documentary filmmakers have used really ingenious uh, techniques and approaches to protecting anonymity. I knew I wasn't gonna put a blur over their faces or, or dark bar or something. Um, and, uh, and I found that a lot, of the, a lot of the technology and artistry that's being used for that didn't fully disguise them, would not have met what we were calling the highest standard of disguise, which was that even your mother would not recognize you. And I had promised everybody in the film that I would review with them the techniques and the, each frame of the film that they were in to make sure that I was not making any um, gaffes on this disguise. Um, so we, we eventually found somebody who was m crazy enough to volunteer this approach, which is um, a reworking of uh, the um, deep fake technology uh, by turning it on its head. Mm -hmm. So instead of changing what people are saying um, by taking a digital model of them and manipulating that, instead we just took somebody else's face and, um, and, and put that face over them. So they're really wearing somebody, else, somebody else's face, but saying and doing exactly what they had said and done as I witnessed with, with my cameras. And, um, and we call it a, a face double technique. And uh, in order to do that, I went to other activists. There are 22 faces replaced in the film, and I went to 22 uh, activists, mostly LGBTQ activists, most, many of them working in this kind of refugee and international global freedom space, uh, and ask them if they would lend their faces as an act of activism to shield the people who are in the film and to um, really to put their own bodies on the line in that way. And I was grateful that so many agreed to do it. And, um, and I think the, the result allows in a way that I think has not ever been accomplished before. People whose lives have been pushed to the shadows to speak again, to reclaim their voice, to reclaim their, their stories, uh, to, to own their histories and share their histories without endangering them in any way. And, um, uh, and so that's what that technique is. I also realized just as an aside that once I replaced their faces that I also sometimes had to replace their shirts and I had to repl replace their tattoos or give them tattoos. Or, so we, we did a lot of work like that also to make sure that that ring that that person was wearing, for example, didn't look like the ring that that person was wearing. Um, 
So this, the work on that front took uh, nearly a year in order to, to finish those disguises and make it possible to show it to your audience. Here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's remarkable, remarkably effective too. And, and we still have that, that emotional connection uh, to, the, to the subjects by seeing them in, in you know, full face, as it were, in full light, in the light. Um, Kamali, do you have any updates on the situation today in the region? Have things changed uh, for the better, hopefully? Have they changed at all? And, and what role is Canada playing in helping to resettle uh, LGBTQ uh, refugees from the region? Yeah, uh, the short answer to the question is no. Things are not better. Um, people are just talking about it less. Uh, and, you know, uh, that brings me to, you know, uh, I, I certainly evolved, and David, <laughs> David knows I've evolved, uh, on um, really the power of this film. Uh, and I think everyone who has seen it uh, now understands the power of it. It wasn't so clear in the middle of it whether it's a good idea to document it. Um, at the time, we were actively negotiating, you know, our role uh, was to first do a on the ground needs assessment, understanding the first tranche of individuals that were affected, gaining the uh, trust of uh, the Canadian government who stepped up first and others who also stepped up. Uh, and so doing all that and then understanding that it was being documented was something that or potentially being documented was something that was nerve wracking, right? And a lot of these times in the spirit of uh, our organization and the Underground Railroad, and David mentioned underground, these operations are generally really clandestine. But I think what our, what the, you know, the heroes in the film and rightfully recognize that, uh, and to get to your question, uh, there has to be some degree of accountability. Uh, and there has to be uh, some uh, um, archival and witness to what's happened. Uh, because, um, you know, it's it's been three years since that original purge, but you, um, what we hope David's film will do is regalvanize the conversation, but it's allowed, it's been allowed to flatline since then. And really that's where the danger lies. It's that these, we know that these things happen in waves and they tend to happen with impunity when no one's watching. Uh, and so it's going to be important and we hope that the, this film just really lets people know just not how um, horrific the situation was then, but nothing fundamentally has changed. Kadyrov has not, and his minions have not been punished in any meaningful way. Putin is still protecting them. And governments have failed to act. And there's been actually a lot of enablers. Uh, and so I'm proud that Canada uh, took a leadership role in accepting the first tranche of individuals. We've since worked with other countries to help uh, and the Russian LGBT work, network doing the lead on neg negotiating those other relationships. Um, David's point is crystal clear at the end that unfortunately the United States did not um, um, accept a full, um, accept individuals. Uh, and so in Canada, what we are doing is to ensure uh, those who have been here had a path to resettlement, but, uh, you know, also continuously alerting the Canadian government and others uh, when these, when there's spikes uh, in these crackdowns in the future. Mm -hmm. And I guess a time like now, this global pandemic we're in, provides a lot of cover for authoritarianism, authoritarian governments to get away with all kinds of things that, that you know, we don't have time to focus on or we're not hearing about. So it's a particular... Yeah, if I, speak, if I can speak specifically to that, in mm. the wake of COVID right now, um, you know, depending on uh, when viewers re, uh, listen to this, um, uh, it's important to note that uh, David's film should be, um, of course, uh, specific in understanding Chechnya, but it's also universal. Uh, as, as, as we speak, um, uh, right now, 19 individuals just got released from detention in Uganda uh, after two months. And under the guise of breaking shelter and place orders in, in, U in Uganda. So they use COVID-19 as a cover to arrest individuals screamed uh, at them for being members of the LGBTQI community and then detained them. Uh, and I can just assure you, if that's happening in Uganda, that's happening in Chechnya right now, that deep underground, that individuals, um, especially 
Uh, one of the frightening things about COVID in relation to Q, uh, LGBTQI rights is that as society, we've already said we're willing to give up some freedoms in order to protect ourselves. And that people, especially folks like Kadyrov, are going to use that to abuse that power to affect members most vulnerable. Mm, yeah, it's a very, very slippery slope. I mean, as we wrap up, I wanted to ask, uh, uh, what's been the response to the film, David? And, and have any of the participants had a chance to see it? What's, what's their feedback been, if they have? Good question. You know, we, we uh, premiered the film at Sundance or earlier this year um, in a different era altogether. Uh, and we were able to all convene there together. And, um, and that was really lovely. Um, so um, Grisha came, uh, so did his, uh, so did um, uh, um, Olga uh, from the Moscow Community Center and Davida Steve from the Russian LGBT network. And we were able to um, really present them as heroes to the audience. And we, and the audience just gave them such love. It was, it was, it was just amazing. We traveled from there to Berlin um, and uh, we had a similar reunion. Uh, and Grisha was able to bring his mother and his family there. And that was really fun. Um, to be with them, and they were received by audiences like rock stars. It was um, just so moving to see. And then we all, you know, went home. We did one other film festival after that, and then we we all hit the same wall together. Um, and so they they are in lockdown, as we are here in New York, and you are there. And um, uh, and I'm praying for a time when we can bring them back and give them to their audience again. Yeah. Just mm. a, a, a remarkable feeling to be, to, 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 to feel the love that people show for them. Oh yeah, that's incredible. And they deserve it all after all that they've, they've been through uh, collectively, but also individually. Um, one last question uh, related to this moment in time, what can we learn from the LGBTQ activists uh, that have gone before us who have so often been at the forefront of organizing and protesting against injustice and ignorance? Uh, and what do we need to be vigilant uh, about at this moment in time? Kamali, do you want to start? I think what makes the film remarkable is these individuals agreeing uh, and, you know, uh, imagine the willingness to sh expose your face. You know, there's only been two Chechens that have gone public uh, who are victims of this accounting. And his, his, you know, his willingness to do so, and not just do so, but to launch an investigation, given that the odds are not in his favor, is an incredible testament to the power of what we need to continuously do. To, uh, and, you know, we need to hold firm and be vigilant to ensure that um, the human rights uh, and freedoms of all LGBTQI persons are protected. Uh, and that, um, you know, I, I really do believe in that um, the phrase, the arc of justice bends towards freedom. Uh, I also know that there's, it whips back and forth. I, unfortunately, we're in this period of time where it's whipped back. Um, and uh, there are some forces that are determined to keep it there, but I do think we will prevail. And I think the power that we have and what David's film has shown us is that we have, we have the, we are, we will win because we are on the right side of history, but we also have the tools in place to ensure that accountability is uh, in place. Mm, definitely. And David, last word to you. <clears throat> You know, Shane, when I, when I got on the plane to go to, to Moscow to uh, try and find this story, I thought I was taking on a, a story of hatred of a kind that I had just never seen before. And what I found there was really a story about love. And I think that that certainly is the motivator for the work that the total strangers we're doing for Chechen um, victims of these crimes um, and the work that uh, LGBTQ activists around the globe like Kamali 
and his colleagues at the Rainbow Railroad are, are, are teaching us is the power of love. And, and I think if you go back to you know, the early part of our movement, um, you find that that's always been the centerpiece of, of queer activism. Uh, it's about, um, not just about the right to love, but it's an expression of love that is really remarkable and can teach the world lessons. Mm, absolutely. That's a, a beautiful note to end on. Uh, thank you very, very much, both of you, for your time. David France, the director of Welcome to Chechnya, Kamali Pal, the executive director of Rainbow Railroad. Thank you both. Thank you, Shane. Thank you.